All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for showing up. My name is Colin Becker. I'm with the programming staff, and I would like to welcome you not only back to Fort Collins, and thank you to those in the internet for watching us here, but welcome to Rubber Monsters and Cardboard Robots. It's the Tokusatsu panel. Uh, this is, I would guess, part two in what I would refer to as my trilogy of things I love that I want to share with everybody as much as humanly possible. Uh, I did a mech anime panel last time we were all here live. So uh, let's get the show on the road, shall we? So uh, we're going to go over a brief overview of what we're going to be doing. Uh, this is basically, you know, uh, a bit of a historical look at the different eras of tokusatsu, what came in, what was falling out of favor, that sort of thing. Uh, we'll play a little, uh, what I like to refer to as, who's that Pokemon? We'll have some photos of some famous people, see if anyone knows who they are. Uh, after that, we will move on to, you know, where to watch some of the stuff, because there's a lot of cool stuff out there, you might not be aware of where you can see it, or you can see it legally for free, which is the best price to watch anything, really. And uh, if we do end up Ending a little early, I've got some cool vid clips we'll play from some old shows, some trailers, and that sort of thing, you know, just to give you a taste of what's to come. So, as with all my panels, I have a couple rules. You know, everyone in here is a fan. We're all the same in that regard, we should treat each other the same. And it's cool to like what you like, and if someone likes something you don't like, that's fine too, you know. Uh, unfortunately, especially on Twitter lately, there's been a lot of negativity. Focus on some family, uh, groups turning on each other and that sort of thing. It's not necessary. It's all love that we enjoy. That's what makes it cool. It's what these heroes would want us to do. So, let's get to the basics. What is tokusatsu? So, literally, it just means special effects. So, uh, you know, it's a genre defined by heavy use of practical special effects. You can combine any other genre out there. So, by the loosest definition, like the original Star Wars movies are tokusatsu. It's Really special, you know, model kits smashed together and then exploded. What more could you ask for? But we're being a little more specific here. Um, normally, when people talk about tokusatsu, it's more about the Japanese media, and it technically usually refers to two different groups. It's the giant monsters, the Daikaiju, or you know your transforming slash ancient heroes, and those would be what we're going to be mainly focusing on today. So. Historically, uh, tokusatsu actually goes back to the earliest ways that the Japanese people entertained each other with uh, Bunraku and Kabuki. Uh, Bunraku uses a lot of life-size puppetry to do special effects. And I mean, how is that really any different than a lot of, you know, like Mothra sometimes is just a puppet on a string flying across the screen. It's not that different. And Kabuki, with its sword play, its bright colors and very flashy outfits, not only is the precursor to, uh, you know, the live action shows that you would see, but, um, you know, the actual shows themselves, bright covered heroes fighting evil, evil monsters. So, uh, at the start, we go back in the 1950s, which is the birth of uh, the icon, the legend, uh, the man that after the kind of look like this cute little hamster right here. It was Godzilla. Obviously, Godzilla took heavy inspiration from 1933's King Kong, a man who we'll be talking about in a little bit, who did the special effects for Godzilla, was fascinated by Western pop culture and Western special effects. He would travel frequently to America just to see what we were up to, and then to bring that back to Japan to spice up what he was doing. Godzilla, the original film, basically gave birth to the concept of suitation. And you know, that is basically one poor person in a heavy suit running across the screen at full boogie. And um, as just kind of an interesting uh, spoiler for things to come, if we do get into the videos, I have a video clip from 2000's Godzilla Millennium, which shows a, a scene in that movie shot in real time, not in the slowed down time that we see in the film. And it's crazy to think of like how quickly these people have to move from spot to spot and hit their points while things are blowing up around. Uh, the original suits were simply latex-covered upholstery foam and concrete frames. These suits also had heads that were just clay that were covered in foam and latex. 
According to the suit actors, these suits weighed in excess of 200 pounds, and the actors could only spend a few minutes at a time in the suit before they had to be pulled out, bathed in ice water, and let to catch their breaths. So when you think about how long these movies are, you know, going into the 78, 90 minute category, there's a reason why you know it's not wall to wall monster fights. It's because these poor guys needed breaks to be able to do things, and that's where the human element story kind of comes in to help out. And as I kind of alluded to previously, uh, the films are shot at a regular speed and then slowed down so that it you know it gives that that size that kind of lumbering nature that we see in the shows. And possibly one of the most famous suit actors is Haruo Nakajima. He uh, was in the Godzilla suit from the start for 20 straight years, doing just non-stop. And that's not including other, you know, Daikaiju movies and even samurai movies. He was in many of the Kira Kurosawa samurai films, too, in banger roles and other big parts. So he's a fantastic guy. He actually was at Anthony Austin shortly before he passed away. And it was a really cool thing to be able to meet Godzilla face to face. Like it was so cool. And in fact, there he is right there. This is how they set up a shot for doing, you know, like the camera would be looking more at Godzilla's feet as he stomped across the road. But that's basically what it looked like. There's the, you know, the Wizard of Oz has been revealed. It was just a poor guy slogging around through that thing. It's wild. And again, like, one of the other things I think this photo does a really great job of is it, it illustrates the detail work that went into the miniatures to make this work. Like, you know, a lot of times when you look at the footage of like, buildings being destroyed, and anything from the guts, or the ultra, and even power rangers, like, the little details, the little furniture that's put in, cars that, you know, will shake and shatter, it's fantastic. You know, it's, that, that attention to detail is something that I fell in love with early on when I started watching these films. So, before we exit the 50s, there are two other tokusatsu movie series and TV series that I've wanted to highlight because they are the progenitors of things we're going to be talking about in a little bit. Uh, Supergiant was in 1958, it was the start of a movie series, and it was the first superhero tokusatsu. Uh, it was much more in line with what like, you would think of in terms of like, the Avengers and the MCU and that sort of thing. But at the time in Japan, that was a completely new idea. And then Moonlight Mask, a year earlier, had come up with that idea in a TV form. And in the 1970s, we will be getting to exactly who those guys inspired. Now, we're going to play the first round of Who's That Pokemon? Can anyone guess who the gentleman who is getting close to Mothra is? H.E.T. Exactly. You are correct. That is A.G. Tsuburaya. He is the father of Tokusatsu. He is the co-creator of Godzilla. He is the man that did all the suit designs for, I want to say, up until the 1970s. So everything came from his mind. And as I said, he was a guy that loved to travel the world to see what other people were doing in special effects and come back and be like, hey, can we add this? Can we do this? You know, we need new things. Let's push it further. And uh, his work at Toho Studios was what he primarily did, but at some point Toho got a little tired of him, so he started his own production company, Super Eye Productions. And for the most part, it was him running around being like, trying to get people to be like, hey, hey, I've got this idea, I've got this idea, you know, pay money for this idea. And people were like, well, you know, you've got Godzilla, you're, you're all set. But at one point, what he wanted more than anything was a brand new high-end film composite. And what that is, is that was the machine that back in the old days would take two different layers of film, put them on top of each other, so you would have Godzilla walking while people were in the same frame, basically. And he thought that the machines that they had at Toho Studios were so antiquated that it looked absolutely fake. And if we just bought this new machine, it would look real life, it'd be amazing, we'll, we'll make millions off it. It's going to be great, boss. Uh, that machine at the time cost $100,000, which is about, you know, $987,000 in today's time. So you might understand why Toho Studios was like, about that. It's a little bit of investment. However, there is one group of people that did want to make that investment, and that was Tokyo Broadcasting. 
They would greet the foot the bill, but they required a Twilight Zone-esque show because that was the hottest thing in Europe and America at the time. That show evolved into what was known as 1966's Ultra Q. It was the X-Files before it was cool. Essentially, the, the, the caveat of the show was that you had a female reporter who was skeptical of any such weirdness in the world, and her two pilot friends who would go off when they heard these weird stories of something in the hills or an earthquake in a weird spot or radiation signals coming from nowhere. And sure enough, every time they went somewhere, giant monsters were waiting for them. And it's a really cool show to me because, considering we're talking about 1966 Japan, the strong female lead in it is astounding. She is whip smart, takes no business from anybody. She often solves her friend, you know, supposedly the dashing square jawed hero and his goofy sidekick. She bails him them out constantly because they're so, ha ha, we've got this. And then suddenly they're about to be eaten by someone. And it's interesting because the actress who plays that character actually gets a long run in all of the other Ultraman TV shows as well because she was so popular with the fans. Now, one of the reasons that Ultra Q was able to use such a large number of suits was because Super I still worked with Toho. So they got access to all the suits he had designed there. And Toho Studios said, well guys, you know, I have one condition, one condition. You need to make sure they look very different. Very, very different. And AG Super I, in the first episode of Ultra Street Q says, okay, we'll make them look different. That is definitely not Godzilla. I assure you. That's Gomez. Gomez is not Godzilla. <laughs> and this is something, it's kind of the fun part of the early 60s Ultraman and Ultra Q shows is finding all of the other suits that they cobbled together and that they, you know, at one point they take another Godzilla suit, and I think it was the Godzilla Return suit, spray painted it yellow, and we're like, yep, this is totally a different monster, guys. And Toho's like, but you just spray painted our suit, dude, like, clean that off. <laughs> so that brings us, of course, to Ultraman. And the power of positivity. Now, as I said, Eiji Tsuburaya loved to travel and he loved Western pop culture. And coincidentally, two years prior to this, the first Green Lantern comic, The Silver Age, came out. And the stories, the origin stories of Green Lantern and Ultraman are almost identical, in which you have two pilots flying at the time when something catastrophic happens and an alien ship crashes into both of them, killing the pilot. But however, the alien decides to sacrifice himself, insert his energy into the human body, and a superhero is created. I mean, it could be coincidence, but it's awfully close. I want to see the version where Abin Sur becomes Ultraman. <laughs> so, one of the other key ideas of Ultraman in general is basically what's known as the science patrol. It's the human element to these shows. It's a group of people who are there to help humanity escape the problems created by giant monsters, but also serve as sort of a moral bounding, bouncing board and cheering squad for Ultraman. Because one of the cool things about Ultraman, even to this day, they've never really deviated from it, is that it's always about believing in yourself, believing in your friends, and overcoming with the power of positivity. Like, at no point do we have a dark night or anything like that. It's, it's one of the few shows that's trying to stay, you know, true to its, you know, kind of square job her role of origins. I mean, we talked about Ultraman Gaia and Ultraman Texas, which are pretty dark. Yeah, I mean, that was part of the, towards the 80s when they started doing, they, they tempted with that, because, like, Common Rider was doing the same thing at the time with Zeno and Jay and that sort of thing. Was, but even then, like, on the comparative scale, especially, like, compared to, say, like, even Common Rider 5. So it wasn't as dark as some of the other stuff out there. Also, uh, one of the things I found amusing, in the first season of Ultraman, there's an episode where the science team travels to the mysterious lands of the Middle East. And I'm like, oh, baby, 1960s Japan during the Middle East. This is going to be special. And they get there, and sure enough, there's an entire civilization of strangely Japanese people in the middle of the desert. And it, the writers at least had enough sense to like have the characters be like, why, 
Why are you here? And it turns out that Ultraman was the original ancient alien and had plucked them from Japan thousands of years ago and had settled them there. And that like all the pyramids and temples and stuff were created by Ultraman. And here's all these giant ancient Ultraman statues. Yes. Also, Yeah, exactly. Well, that's because watching early Ultraman was kind of fascinating because A.G. Sibirai was a Buddhist, but going into the late 60s, early 70s, he converted to Christianity. And you see, you know, not so much like the Christian morals, but rather like the historical events of Christianity getting filtered through the Ultraman phase. And then knowing that later on, Hideaki Anno, director of Evangelion and other fine shows, was such a big Ultraman fan, and you wonder why all his explosions look like crosses. You can kind of start connecting with the dots there. Uh, the other fun fact was that originally Ultraman was going to be named Bemular. And at the last minute, A.G. Sabrina was like, no, 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 I, I feel like, you know, Ultra Q, we should keep it tied right to the, the Ultra we've got going, let's go Ultraman. And so Bemular actually ends up being the name of one of the reoccurring villains throughout the Ultra series instead. Now, who knows who this gentleman might be? Shotaro Ishinomori? You are correct, sir. That is Shotaro Ishinomori. He started, he's a mangaka. He got his start as Osama Tezuka's personal assistant, working on a lot of the classics. And then when he left to do his own thing, he, you know, he created a couple mangas called The uh, Common Rider and uh, Go Ranger, which became part of the Super Sentai. And right here, I actually have the complete Kamen Rider manga that was released here. Uh, there's another beautiful hardcover that is the Go Ranger series as well. They're definitely worth checking out if you need a chance. Plus, with the rarity of, especially printed tokusatsu stuff in English translation, it's worth grabbing while you can get it. That's not to say that's the only thing Ishimori did in terms of manga that got translated into tokusatsu. Uh, he did Kikaider, Hakaider, Robot Keiji, Inazuma Man, Akamizu 3, the absolutely absurd Kaiketsu Zuma. If you guys have not seen that, it's a tokusatsu sci-fi western where a dude in like an all-black leather cowboy outfit with a guitar, shades of the Desperado movies, goes from town to town with a whip, beating up masked baddies and then pulling out weapons out of his guitar case. It is... It's great stuff. It is so absurd. It's what I love about this stuff. So, you might be asking me, what the heck is Batman doing here? Well, Batman is the reason why we have Kamen Rider and Super Sentai. At the time, in the early 70s, Japan was rebroadcasting all of the Adam Westberg War Batmans. And it was the highest rated TV shows they had going on. Like, nothing could touch it. And so Toei's sitting there going, oh man, we need, we need like our own Batman, we need our own Superman, and you know, we need something to be able to grab it. And that's what gave us Kamen Rider. Kamen Rider is their response to Batman. And starting in 1975, it ran nonstop to 1989. And took a hiatus for 2000 when Kamen Rider and Kino came back and was, has been running from 2000 till today and probably onwards, you know? I thought, uh, I thought it was Kuga. Oh, Kuga, you are correct. I put the wrong thing down. You got me. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, while Kamen Rider was actually a huge smash right out the door, the Sentai series had a much harder time catching on because a lot of what we know as like Sentai and Power Rangers now wasn't there. So Toei gave up on Sentai in 1978. They said, nah, we're done with this. You know, we're gonna we're gonna do something else. And they said, well if we can't if we can't beat comic books, let's join comic books. And that gave us yes. Toei Spider-Man. It'll be a paradox, of course. Yes. So this was part of a really weird media exchange right between Marvel and Toei. Toei got Spider-Man. They got the rights to Captain America, 
which they then retooled to become the Battle of Fever J. Sentai series after Spider-Man. And two of Dracula, which they then used to make a one-off horror film. And in return, Marvel got the rights to the designs for the next Dengar Ace Combatler V, Combatler V, Combatler V, and the Aparadon to use in the Shogun Warriors comics and go kind of entitled Toy Lights. So, like, and at the time, this was kind of a, oh, you know, it doesn't seem as weird now when, like, Ultraman has Marvel comics coming out on, like, a you know, bi yearly basis and that sort of thing. But you didn't see the sort of level of back and forth. Usually it was one side really taking everything and giving nothing. But this show was a smash hit. And it was a smash hit, if I can go back screen, for one reason the large robot. Everybody loved the apparel and the fact that he would go around smashing the crime while Spider Man would be climbing walls and shooting web. So when the license deal ended up ending one year later, like I said, they took Captain America's, the ideas they had for a totally Captain America, retooled it back into uh, a Sentai show. We got Battle of J, the first Sentai show with robots, thus creating the modern Super Sentai that we all know and love. Alright, let's get to the 1980s now. So, 1980s, Sentai viewership's going up, Kamen Rider is dropping off. Even with Black and Black RX, which are considered by like you know Japanese fans to be one of the best shows, it still could not hold on the strong TV ratings. And so this is when they decided to pull the plug. But Toei didn't give up on Tokusatsu in general. They decided to create their own whole new IP without having to deal with oh yes sir. Yeah, so uh, one of the things we'll be getting to, I think, just in a little bit, is the, as the Showa era came to an end, a lot of the shows still recycled the same format from the original TV show. And in the early 90s, which we'll talk about, they, they tried one last gasp to grab some new attention, to make it edgier, to make it darker. But it didn't take, for whatever reason, so it's, it was one of those things where they, they held on to tradition for too long, and then when they decided to make the changes, they'd already been passed by. But Toei instead created the show Space Chef Gamma, and that gives us the Metal Heroes franchise. Now, if you grew up in the 90s, as we will talk about too, you will recognize that these guys came from some shows you saw on your morning TV, brought to you by Saban. Now there's a ton of shows. I mean, this went from 82 to 99. I didn't even think it, the Metal Hero series lasted that long. I thought it was a lot shorter. But you had the, the Space Sheriff series. The Space Sheriff series. I say that three times fast. Which is Galvan, Sheravan, and Shader, as well as the Rescue Police series, Wing Spectre, Soul Green, and X Seed as well as the two B Fighter shows, Jugo and Kabuto. Now, while they were popular in Japan, these actually ended up being huge, both in the Philippines and in Brazil, where apparently someone said to buy the rights to them, and the shows are in like high demand to this day. Like it's really cool to see like online like when Philippine conventions happen, because the number of like Metal Heroes cosplay you get and how awesome it is, you know, with the, the LED lights glowing and all that sort of thing. That's a that's one of the things, is that the, one of the things that really inspired the Metal Hero stuff was, to one degree, Star Wars. That's why a lot of it is in space opera type settings, and also Robocop. They love the, again, the spaceships, rescue police, like is that, that sort of idea becomes very popular. And so using those popular sci-fi tropes to capture the audiences all sorts of places. Hmm. All right, so we now move into the 90s and we're going to get into some of the things I was talking about. But who is this gentleman with the swanky leather hat? Does anyone have an idea? Right? The answer to that is that is Keita Amamiya. 
He started his career as a designer for Sentai and Metal Gear was a comic writer. Uh, a lot of the classic monster designs are things that you would recognize as his work. Uh, he was so well regarded for his work, especially in Kamen Rider Black and Black RX, that they made him a director of the two of the three movies that Toei made in an attempt to break the tradition of Kamen Rider and to end up with something a little more edgy. Because they started with uh, Kamen Rider Shin, not to be confused with Shin Kamen Rider, in very simple things, which was more of a, almost like a bio body horror take on Kamen Rider. So a Geiger. Yeah, like very much the guy. Like if you watch that movie, you'll you'll be like, oh yeah, I, I remember this. And interestingly enough, uh, the live action battle movies also had suit designs by Kira. Yep. Uh, then you had Kamen Rider J, which was kind of it was like them backtracking. Like they decided they made a mistake with Shin. They're like, so what if we made a movie that's kind of like the '60s, but also with like all the gore from that other movie? And audiences still didn't really go for it. And then uh, the much the much unloved Kamen Rider ZOO, which was just, I mean, fine, we're going to make one last classic movie, there was nothing we can do about it. And the fans said, there is something we can do about it, we can not watch it. And thus we, uh, we say goodbye to Kamen Rider for a while. However, that didn't uh, phase Amamiya san he actually went on to do a lot of uh, OVAs in the 90s because thanks to the bubble economy at the time, there was a ton of money being thrown around just for a short little 8, 90 minute directed video films. Uh, two of the ones that Amelie is known best for was Zyram, which was also uh, tied into the anime area at the time, as well as the insanely named Mechanical Violator Akaida, which was based loosely off of one of Shitaro Ishinomori's works. But that movie is essentially, uh, you know, whether you want to call it uh, Yojimbo or A Fistful of Dollars, in a post-apocalyptic world with a robot with an exposed brain. And it's, it goes exactly how you think it. But it would take another 10 years for Amadeus-san to finally achieve what he's been trying to do this whole time, to create a tokusatsu show that has the action and the excitement that young people want, but it's aimed for a more modern audience when he finally releases Guard. And now who can tell me who these two fine gentlemen are? Oh, come on now, Jake. I know you. The guy on the left looks like Dave Grohl, but I know that's not <laughs> right. Yeah, that is not Dave Grohl. These two men are, in fact, Heim Sabin and Shuki Levy. I found that was back when they were a recording duo. Oh. Before they were entertainment moguls, they were a two piece music band. Hmm. But they are the founders of Saban Entertainment. Much like Harmony Gold did before them, they bought the rights to Japanese TV shows and we told them for the US audience you, you might know some of these things like I for Power Rangers, Masked Rider, well, VR Troopers, which was based off the Metal Heroes, and of course Big Bad Beetleborgs, also based off the Metal Heroes. And these shows are great because I think for most people here, like that was how we all got introduced to the, the genre in general. Like and it's continued on to this day, which is kind of cool, whether it was over like Saban or Disney or Saban, you know, the titles have bounced around, but it's still, you know, young people today are being exposed to this stuff, and, you know, hopefully we can show them all the other cool stuff that comes from it, you know? And today, we're now in the modern times, Tom Rider bounces back with, I did the same thing again. I'm very, Jake, I'm very good at my inconsistencies about Kamen Rider games. So, Kuga, Kamen Rider Kuga we bounced back to it. Uh, Tsuburaya Productions actually got into a very long battle in the late 80s, early 90s, and I think until 2015 with uh, the Singapore, Singaporean production company that handled distribution of their product to East Asia. And 
essentially, it, it's very similar to what Harley Gold did with that cross to make Robotech, where they were like, oh yeah, we'll release this. And you just need to sign this rights document over. And their supervisor was like, oh, certainly. And then they're like, no, now we own all of And it, it was wild, because I did some research because I really wanted to get to know like, what was going on. And it started with Super I going to a court in Japan and being like, no, we own it. And the other company provided documents, and the Japanese court sent it to the Singapore company. So then they took it to Singapore, showed the same documents, and the Singapore court sided with Tsuburai. And this basically went back and forth and back and forth for like 20 years, until finally um, the most recent Japanese court decided to go, okay, you know, we're going to agree with the Singapore court at this point. This is, in fact, the product of Japan. It is Tsuburai's production. And that leads to essentially the giant Ultraman boom that we had been. We would not be able to get the Marvel comic series, with which I think we're getting uh, another one starting up in a couple months, actually. Yeah. The fact that we now get current Ultraman shows basically day and day online on YouTube with English subtitles. You know, that's because of that. The, the deals with Mill Creek and the Shadow Factory and all that stuff. That's all because they finally got control. And as I had said, uh, Amamiya San's Garo comes out in 2006. And it's a very different creature at the time because it was, you know, probably 75% CGI. Like CGI backgrounds, CGI monsters, CGI action. And it, at the time, it kind of shows its early CGI works, but in a way, it sort of also predicted like how we'd be making shows now, where it's essentially like actors on a green screen, you know, staring at tennis balls, and that's how they fought. You know, again, they still kept enough rubber suits, enough, you know, classic armor, you know, real fights with stunt people, but still stay within the genre. But, you know, it it definitely pushed Tokusatsu to the point where like I think a lot of the reason why you see like in the modern uh, you know, Sentai stuff, there's a lot more CGI mech fights and that sort of thing. It's because of that. It's become more acceptable. Okay, come on. Who knows this man? Someone out here knows him. Hideaki Anno. That's correct. That is Hideaki Anno. He was the founder of Studio Gainax. He now was the founder of Studio Kara after leaving Gainax. Uh, his first animated film he ever directed before he did anything he might be better known as was an Ultraman parody film. He also directed a live action Q D Honey movie, which uh, this is not an 18 plus panel, so we're really not going to dive into Q D Honey all that much, but uh, you know, sort of save search on it. That's all I'm saying. And of course, as we know, Hideaki Anno went on to direct one of the most influential anime of all time, Mahoro Manic. No, wait, that's not right. It was a robot show. Robot show. Most influential robot show of all time. Yep. No. Gun Buster? No. No. Not that one. No. Uh, clearly, it's uh, Neo Genesis Evangelical. That was the show he was most famous for. But the reason we're bringing him into this is because he has uh, used Studio Car to create what is called the Shin Universe, which starts somehow with the rebuild of the Megalian movies and then jumps into Shin Godzilla, Shin Ultraman, and the upcoming Shin Kong Rider. In typical Anno fashion, he hasn't told us how any of this actually connects to anything other than he just said it did. So I'm sure there's some great fan theories out there about how, you know, Asuka is in fact the soul in Godzilla which beget Jet Jaguar, so Ultraman, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's... Someone's got a substack all about it, I assure you. So, I mean, as we see, there's, I mean, that's the thing, like, I have glossed over a lot of other shows. Like, these are not the only Tokusatsu shows out there. There's a ton of other stuff. But, like, to, it's almost a deep dive for any subject. Like, you know, this is trying to cover as much as possible. So where can you watch what we've been talking about thus far? Well, Godzilla, if you want to get it physically, the best collection we've got right now is the Criterion Collection of the Showa movies in Blu-ray. Uh, unfortunately, 
while it has a really cool, you know, almost sort of like flip book style presentation, the box itself isn't well built and the CDs tend to, or Blu-rays tend to fall through the box. Uh, streaming wise though, if you want to catch just about anything from the original up to the modern stuff, including the American Godzilla's, uh, HBO Max is your spot at the moment. Also, Voodoo? Yep, that is true. And I think that there's a bit on Amazon. Yeah. Now, let's say you're looking for Ultraman. Well, physically, uh, Mill Creek's Blu-rays and DVDs are the best. Like, in terms of value, you get entire season shows, so 26 to 52 episodes, depending on the show, for like $20, and $14 for movie collections. Like, it's a steal, and part of that is because Mill Creek and Shout Factory and Subaraya have gotten together, and they want to make Ultraman global. That is their goal, is to not make it the Japanese guy who fights monsters anymore. It's going to be Ultraman for the people in the world. So they're taking losses essentially to get it into a hand, which is red. You know, it's not not standard business practice in that regard. Uh, if you want to watch it on streaming, most of the old shows are on Tubi if you don't want to pay anything, or Tokushatsu, which is uh, Shop Factory's both free streaming and online subscription service because they have both a free Twitch channel, a free streaming channel, which isn't the Twitch channel, and then they have. The premium service where you can just watch whatever you want, whatever you want. And uh, starting up next month, actually, we've got Ultraman Decker coming out, which will be in multi language subs on YouTube for free. Common Rider, unfortunately, this is where things get a little more dire. Uh, there's only one, well, no, there's technically two series of Kamen Rider that are out available physically. The most easy one to find is Shout Factory's release of Zero One. The pain in the butt one to find is the old, the Hawaiian TV show, the TV station that bought the rights to Kamen Rider V3 back in the 70s, then put out a limited edition 12 DVD disc set for like $500. Which, of course, now is unobtainium and now worth like multiples of that money. But if, hey, if you've got the bank and you want to find it, it's out there, I assure you. And then we get into the strange, look, the strange situation of if you want to try to stream these shows. Uh, Toei's Tokusatsu YouTube channel technically has all of the episodes of all the common writer shows, except everything but the first two episodes are blocked, even if you use a VPN. No one knows why, but this is what it is. Um, however, the one thing they do do that's nice is all of the movies that have come out are starting to be put on there for free to watch. Um, essentially what happened was, was during the pandemic, the Japanese government was issuing grants to help propagate Japanese culture throughout the world, so that when things got better, people would be interested in going to Japan and seeing what they had to offer. And both Tsuburaya and Toei sat there and grabbed big chunks of this, and essentially paid to have all their shows subbed and released, and have film festivals online, basically. Uh, that's why Ultraman has a lot of what they call the Ultra Connection events at this point, where they bring in the voice actors, and you watch the movies and the shorts and that sort of thing. Uh, Sentai, unfortunately, also has a bit of a problem because uh, Shout Factory was putting out the DVDs of the Japanese series with Saban's Blessing, because Saban still technically owns the right for the US distribution of that stuff. But uh, supply did not, or demand did not equal supply, so they ended up discontinuing making any new ones, and I believe they're still making the ones that they already did. But you can see most of that stuff online via Tokyo Shotsu. So Toby Spider-Man is an interesting one because no one owns the rights to Toby Spider-Man at the moment. It's one of those weird things where Marvel can't claim it, Toby can't claim it. But if you go to archive.org, there's the entire subtitled series waiting for you to watch. So you can see the silliness there. Well, it was also on the Marvel website for the longest time, too. Yeah, it's it's so weird. It's it's one of those things, I, it's got to be like a Night of the Living Dead type situation, where the, 
the weirdness of the wordings of the contracts has basically allowed it to drop into obscurity. And basically anyone who wanted to make it up could do so and run with it. Um, Metal Heroes, physically you can find it, uh, only one series of it, uh, released via discotheque. Uh, it's a standard def on Blu-ray sort of situation. Uh, Toby's Tokusatsu channel does also have a bunch of that stuff, but again, if it's the shows that Saban used for, like, you know, Big Bad Beetleborgs, VR Troopers, that sort of thing, they're not going to be there. Uh, My Dwarf Power Rangers follows pretty much the same thing. You can get, you know, season sets from Shout Factory still, and uh, the Roku channel, some stuff on Netflix, and the Disney stuff is still on Disney Plus, so. And alas, uh, Garo, uh, this is the only way to watch the physical show were these DVDs that were released by Section 23. Uh, they ended up going out of business because they were super duper shady. And now these Blu-ray sets go for like $75 a pop. You can, however, watch the animated shows on Funimation. They have the entire run. Uh, there's no like if you're worried, if you want to check it out, if you're worried that there's like, oh, you know, am I going to be missing stuff? All the, all the animated shows are non-mechanic. They are just independent tellings of stuff. You won't miss them. So that is the presentation part of this. Uh, let's go to if anyone's got any questions or comments. Otherwise, we will jump into some cool video clips, sir. Uh, when you refer to the Ultraman Gold series being available, is that the 60s Gold series? I, I watched that as a kid. Oh yeah, no, like you can watch um, on like to be for free. There's the original Ultraman. There's Ultra Q, which was the show that came before. Like, all that old, all the classic 60s and 70s stuff is free to just enjoy. Awesome. Yeah, it is really cool. Like I've been, I'm through Ultraman. Oh god, it's not my favorite. Taro, an Ultraman Taro, right? and it's just. It's great, it's absurd, it's fun, it's, it's for the children, don't you know? <laughs> Alright, well, it looks like we don't have any questions. So let's start jumping into some of the video clips here. Uh, I will start off with number one here. This is from Godzilla 2000. This is a behind the scenes shot of uh, when the spaceship has landed on top of the building, the square off against Godzilla, it blows up, and this will give you an idea of exactly the pace that these guys have to work in. Oh, am I not getting sound for that? I'm not. Okay. Well, we'll figure it out after this guy. And then it comes swinging. There's Godzilla, probably running as fast as he can, and that. Like that is an entire scene right there. That is one take. And you only get one shot at that because as you can see, everything is pretty much trashed. And like it's crazy to think that like there's a poor guy hunched over in that suit. They get them out because of the explosions. Again, like, yeah, it's just amazing to look at. Like, look at the set design. Like, look at the. It's so good. It must be awful to like do all that and then only for some some chud on the internet to be like, oh, this one sucked. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember, I think it was uh, during the making of Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, uh, Nakajima-san told the story of at one point, because there's, you don't, you can't, I mean, they do such a great job of having it in Godzilla suits. There's actually, like, in the neck, there's little slits that they use as eyes to be able to see where they're going. When they did like the classic scene of the jets flying by and launching all the firework missiles at them, two fireworks got stuck in the eye slots, and so he had to finish the scene as he's basically blind and there's 
fire being spread. Oh my god. But he he sat there at the panel, he's like, oh yeah, you know, it's just it's just another day. <laughs> <laughs> So, the thing is, is when, like, if they were just to film Godzilla moving at a regular pace, even in the giant suit, it still very much feels like a human in a suit walking. So, I, I have to guess it was probably through a trial and error, they found, like, the correct speed to slow the film down with him moving at that pace to, you know, kind of match sort of like what Ray Harryhausen thought dinosaurs were lumbering like back in the 30s and that sort of thing. Now we will jump over to Ultraman. This is from the first series. Get over there. There we go. This is Ultraman versus Red King from the first series. Look at that beautiful face. <laughs> I also love the fact that the old Ultraman was just like a solid thing flying through the air. And a fun fact, like, the Ultraman suit was essentially, you know, a fancy new green diving suit. And the paint refused to actually stay on the suit. So, like, in between takes, they would have to freshly apply paint to him. Oh my God. That's kind of part of the reason why he's always had sort of that shiny color to him. And why, like, in some of the later you know, episodes in the series, the alternate look a lot more haggard because the paint has been peeling off and they've just kept reapplying the paint. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that, like, people really loved about Ultraman as they were children was the fact that, like, where Godzilla was always, you know, primarily like a distance ranged attack sort of thing. Ultraman, you know, it was a pro wrestling match. And pro wrestling was huge in Japan at the time. So to be able to mix these two elements together, you know, became this sort of magical combination. So the, the um, Ultraman predates Jet Jaguar, yeah? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Jet Jaguar was a shout out to Ultraman. Jet Alone and Evangelion was a shout out to Jet Jaguar. <laughs> Shin Ultraman, if you believe the the theories, Shin Ultra, the plot to Shin Ultraman was actually supposed to be the second Shin Godzilla movie before uh, Toho re-upped with Universe, or Legendary to do Godzilla vs. Kong. Really? And so that's why it's Ultraman, because it was going to be a Jet Jaguar movie. Because Anno is obsessed with Jet Jaguar, and no one knows why. <laughs> All right. Now, we mentioned Battle Fever J being the first Sentai show to actually show the Transformer Robot. So here we go. This is the first ever Sentai Henshin for a giant robot. I love the wig. That's it's horrifying. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> like it's almost like a bunch of Mega Man villains as the heroes. You got Pharaoh Man. You got Fire Man. You got Wig Woman. <laughs> and it's interesting. Like looking at these. Desires for you know what we call these words in our rangers. Like this is before everything got to be like super chunky, and you can see like there's a lot more you know mobility in the combat. It reminds me a lot of the, uh, the Beastie Boys music video of Richard Black. Of course, now he magically has a. Ooh, sorry. 
<laughs> that carabiner did so much work. Oh, it did. Heavy duty. Like, this is actually pretty brutal, like, compared to your regular Sentai fight. Like, there's axes and old costume attack. The ultimate attack. Swords in a circle. Yeah, my my watch says 750. Dang, I, I have a, an alarm set for 745 and it went off and that's at 749. Well, don't worry, we still got some more videos to go. But that's thank you for giving me the heads up because I've been running off that clock. I'm like, oh man, I'm doing good on time. It's been a year. That's why I have extra videos. Alright, let's do a little triple transformation from uh, Space Sheriff Gavin here. Those 80 styles, so fresh. But like again, I love the just the, the shiny metallic designs. Just makes me want to watch Big Bad Blue or something. Especially because they're like not Jay Leno or something. <laughs> Gotta have that triple roll ball baby. You said this was in the early 80s? Yeah, this uh, this came out in 82. I think you can make the argument these guys inspired Robocop, because Robocop was 87. That's true. You make a good point. But definitely, like, when you look at some of the later Metal Hero stuff. Oh, yeah, like, absolutely. The, like, chunkier ones. Yeah. Uh, and now, since I mentioned earlier, let's, uh, let's get that Shin Kong Rider shirt. Oh. Yeah. I love the fact that Mono was like, yes, we need to make sure his hair is pulled out of himself. So that's what they did in the 60s. <laughs> Let's see. And in one of the other trailers, they make it pretty clear that like, in this version, there's no transformation for Common Rider. He's always in his own which is why he's always wearing those bulky coats. And of course, uh, the first villain is Spider-Man, because in every Kamen Rider show, Spider-Man and Batman are like the first two people to get beaten. That's gonna be so good. That's gonna be so good. I cannot wait. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna need to watch the other Shin movies first. Shin Godzilla. Shin Godzilla. Shin, Shin, Shin Ultimate. Yeah. Down for some shit, that's all. Alright, well, let's get to the bonus videos. Yeah, I'm gonna start with possibly one of the most famous scenes from uh, the Tommy Spider Man. Uh, so, Spider Man uses his most deadly weapon. No, not Leo Paradon. No, not his webs or his brains. The gun? It's when Spider Man finds a gun. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just not Spider Man with the oh, gun. Okay, I got so excited about shooting Ultraman, I flipped it twice. <laughs> Spider Man, give me a gun. Oh, he oh, actually climbing skills. I guess these are aim soldiers? I don't know. <laughs> Take that! Toby Spider Man is that it's not Peter Parker at all. Like they, they don't even like pretend that it's anything to do with like Marvel Spider Man. It's just a dude in a Spider Man outfit. Like you can just think of it as like this one day this dude woke up and said, I'm Spider Man. 
<laughs> found a giant robot and a Tommy gun and was like, let's go, baby! Homeboy chose violence. He <laughs> right. needed something to cover his face and it just wasn't there. Exactly. The now, that's not to say it's the only time tokusatsu heroes and villains have found guns. From the recent uh, sort of comedy spinoff of Ultraman Z was the uh, Sevenger Battle series. Here, Sevenger Battle, our good friend Sevenger here, he will take on the evil villain Eliking. Eliking has a surprise. And I don't think anyone was ready for it. So the idea is essentially that the cast is watching this fight, and then, yep, he finds a machine gun. <laughs> and Sevenger does not know how to deal with this. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this is the infamous uh, gravel pit that everything anywhere in any Tokusatsu show has been filmed. Rock beats gun. <laughs> Rock does not be done. America's best science. Doesn't be Robot that throws rocks. <laughs> Apparently, this is actually in reference to an old gag comic that came out in one of the Ultraman magazines, where Ella King, who's notoriously known for not being a very effective monster, finally got fed up, shrank himself down to a human, and stole an armory's worth of weapons to cause chaos. And so the creators of this were like, ah, oh, that's what we need to do. <laughs> I just have to imagine these two actors were having a blast doing this, just being like, I'm gonna run. Or a foam rock section. <laughs> oh, no. No, no, he's got a rock and a gun. <laughs> Two OP. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, this is another series that's actually free on YouTube, and it's really worth getting because it is so silly like this. It's just the idea is that the cast of uh, Ultraman Z are watching. Sevenger on like a satellite footage and they're trying to like cheer him on and that's why you hear the cut like there's a constant dialogue going so like, hey you know maybe what if he ducked would he duck the bullet could that work you know it's kind of mst3k in some sort of way what is that called uh, that is called seven beer fight and then let's see who we got got one more trick let's leave like that yeah, so I was talking about Garo and like the, the fusion of CGI and uh, I've got two minutes. I think we can get this one. So this is a big final battle in one of the Garo movies actually. To give you an idea of what they what it really looks like. And I'm I'm not gonna lie, some of the CGI is not not super, but considering this is done on like a next to nothing budget. You can definitely, I mean, you can definitely tell it's like a more modern, yeah, more modern. Couple. But like, I, mean, I love the look of the suit, the gold. I mean, yeah, using yeah, the shiny metal good. suit to kind of mask some of the CGI in things too. Yeah, really play. Cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like a lot of, a lot of like common writers from Deno onwards look like this. Yeah, exactly. music plays as we now have another sort of fight. Like this reminds me a lot of like, especially the modern Kamen Rider movies where every fight has to end in some sort of like giant CGI disaster monster of some sort. <laughs> and you're like, no, just, 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 just,
kick it. That's it. Just, just kick it. Yeah? Right, okay. But I really do encourage, like, if you find a way to watch Garo to give it a chance, because it is, the story of it is cool because it's about essentially a generation's deep curse of this one family. And they're being forced to fight demons. And how that affects, like, people. Like, you know, it gets into some of the deep, like, PTSD of that sort of hero. And I do believe. We just got the landing, guys, so thank you so much for coming out to this. I hope you guys had some fun, learned a few things, realized that superheroes with guns are the most fearsome superheroes. <laughs> and I hope you enjoy the rest of your portrait.